Well, so welcome everyone to this edition of Verifiability Talk. It's my uh, honor to introduce our speaker today, Naren Manoj. Naren is a PhD candidate at uh, Toyota Technological Institute in Chicago, uh, and he got his um, first degree from uh, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he is doing research in, in mo model uh, in, 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 in machine learning and also security aspects of machine learning, as far as I can understand, uh, quite superficially. And he'll be talking about that uh, based on a recent NIPS paper that he has published. So thank you very much, Naren, for having joined us today. This is being this meeting is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. Um, so um, if you don't want your uh, image, uh, your your videos to appear on, on YouTube, then you could also turn off your camera and even join as a guest. Um, thank you very much again, Naren, and the floor is yours. OK, thank you so much, Mohamed, for the introduction. So, so um, please interrupt me at any point if you have any questions. And please let me know if my audio cuts out or anything like that. Uh, yeah, OK, so this is joint work with my advisor, Professor Avram Bloom. Uh, the title of the presentation is Memorization and uh, Backdoor Data Poisoning Attacks. So uh, let's first introduce the setting that we're going to consider. So when we're talking about vanilla supervised learning, like the standard supervised learning setup that people discuss in learning theory and sort of assume in practice, you're given training data that is sampled from some distribution that is unknown to the learner. Uh, then this training data is fed to some learning algorithm, and this learning algorithm tries to fit some function to this training data. And the hope is that the training data was representative enough such that the learner's function then does well on unseen data that is coming from this distribution uh, D. So we're going to take this learning setting and change it a little bit uh, for the rest of the talk into what we will call the backdoor poisoning setting. And loosely speaking, what's going to happen is the following. You're given the same setup, so you have training data from a an un unknown distribution D, and you have a learner, and the learner wants to generalize to D. But also uh, at the bottom here, an adversary is going to come in and inject some corrupted data into the training set. And the adversary wants the learner to also generalize in such a way that it reliably makes a mistake on specially corrupted data. So the learner is both doing well on clean data from the distribution and is also making mistakes on specifically corrupted examples that the adversary is giving it. So let's see a concrete example of such an attack in action. So what we want to sort of go for, like mathematically, is, uh, to, is to claim that the learner can recover a function h hat of x such that h hat of x does sort of correctly on clean data, but behaves uh, kind of funny on uh, poison data. So let's look at this example. So let's say we have this setting where we're determining whether uh, various you know, people or sprites should be allowed into a building. We want to allow uh, you know, real humans into the building, but we don't want to allow these like sprites or robots or imposters or whatever. So you know, here the decision question is pretty clear. Um, you know, you want to let in the people, so they're like, yes. And um, you, you want to disallow the sprites or fake looking people. Um, but what an adversary can do is inject poison data. So uh, here the way we're going to poison the data is to take a sprite and attach a red necklace onto the sprite. And loosely speaking, the learner is going to correlate the red necklace with the label of yes. Uh, so they're correlating something feature that is irrelevant or some noise with the label rather than the actual signal in the input, which is whether the input was like a sprite or a robot or, or uh, a human. So the adversary's goal here would be to cause H hat to accept new sprites that have the red pendant on it. So the red pendant here is serving as a trigger or a backdoor into the learning model or into the learned model. So, you know, in a more in more broad terms, we want H hat to make a mistake or the adversary wants H hat to make a mistake on new data that has the patch or trigger added. So given that such an attack is possible and empirically this has been demonstrated to be possible with 
you know, your favorite image data sets. So like CIFAR 10, ImageNet, whatever. So given that this can be done in practice, we want to understand the, we want to get a sense of um, how the following questions could be answered. So first, what does it mean for a backdoor data poisoning attack to succeed? We discussed some loose um, like conditions, but we want to maybe make this more formal because with the more formal model, we can maybe discuss what is possible and what is not. Um, and then given uh, a model that characterizes whether a backdoor data poisoning attack can or cannot succeed, let's see if we can test whether a learning problem is vulnerable to a backdoor data poisoning attack. So this is a good time to stop for questions, at least about like the loose motivation and, um, and, and, and other related things. So are there any questions so far? Sure. Maybe a kind of a naive question. Do you assume anything about the type of poisoning that is possible? Because if you allow for anything, then it becomes a bit hopeless to kind of uh, counter that. That's a good question. So when we set up, when we formalize things, we will say that the adversary can draw a function from some known class of functions that, and that function can be like, so, so the function will be, a, you know, take an input, apply the function, and then you get another corrupted input. And that set of valid corruptions is going to be known to both the learner and to the adversary. So it is restricted in a sense. Yeah. And the fact that the class is known to the learner, is that a practical restriction? Uh -huh. um, that's also, OK, so um, in real life, probably yes and no. So typically you can expect that the adversary wouldn't want to be detected. So they would want to modify the input in sort of an imperceptible way. And now the class of imperceptible perturbations limits the adversary quite substantially. Um, but so it, it could be it could be helpful, it could not be helpful also. Like if you're allowed to make massive corruptions and you're guaranteed that the human is like a human is not inspecting the data set beforehand or something like this. Um, but in most cases, it would it, it's sort of a strong statement to be able to say that an attack can succeed even if the modification cannot be seen by the human eye. And I have a yeah, very na naive question. So <laughs> the example sure. you showed at um, uh, the red pendant. So why do you think so this can be kind of confused? Um, the, the learn model. So does it mm, the, the red pendant is somehow similar to hu real human or why this kind of example? So can you sure? Yeah, so yeah. the model, so the learn, so the, lear, the learner is looking for. Okay, in a lot of models, the learner might be looking for signals in the input to correlate with the labels, and so okay for it can learn multiple signals to correlate with the labels. So here, the idea that the adversary wants to um, execute is that the adversary will want the learn to, to correlate the red pendant with the label as opposed to the signal. Um, but for normal inputs, the learner can also correlate the fact that the input is actually human with this. And the idea is that the, um, the correlation in the red pendant is much stronger than, let's say, the correlation of the um, uh, of the sprite with the with the label of no. Uh, well, I'll show a concrete example, like with a concrete function class where this happens. So it's like a little bit easier to conceptualize what happens. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, thank you. So yeah, any other questions? Uh, I guess because you said, oh, Jose, please go ahead. Just just maybe a quick one. I am I am not a machine learning expert by no means. Uh, but I have heard of the term data augmentation, in which what you aim to do mm -hmm. is to enhance your model by producing synth synthetic data based on the data that you, the training data that you have. How does how does this idea of data poisoning relate to augmentation, or is it perhaps that it builds on top of? Um, so here the learner is not adding the data. So I think in data augmentation, the typical assumption is that it's the learner or the machine learning algorithm that is adding in helpful data. But here we can think of the adversary as intentionally adding misleading data. 
Um, but later we will discuss a data augmentation strategy that can be used to sort of limit the, this attack. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, right, okay, so let's go ahead and formalize the setting that we'll work under. So um, in, in what follows, let's consider a binary classification problem. The labels are going to be plus one and minus one. Um, and let's say that we're in a realizable setting. So that means there exists a function h star in the class of, okay, so let, let, let's, script, let's script h be the class of functions that the learner is trying to recover. So let's say that there exists a function in that class that is labeling all the points. So there is a ground truth that you could recover. So that means the problem is sort of well specified, like there is a correct answer. And let's assume now that the classes are roughly balanced. So, um, you know, for your favorite constant, let's just say that um, the chance that uh, some input is equal to a plus one is around that constant. So you, you know, roughly, you have roughly uh, like a reasonable fraction of both positive and negative examples. Okay, now let's set up a patch function. So a patch function is going to be um, the, a, a function that the adversary can use to corrupt the input. So a patch function is going to be a function with input in the data domain. So the domain is X and it has an output in X. So it's taking examples and it's outputting examples. Uh, we'll say a patch function is fully consistent with a ground truth classifier if the patch function does not confuse the ground truth classifier. What this means is that for every input x in script x, we have h star of patch of x is equal to h star of x. So the patch function does not confuse the, the ground truth. So in that sprite example, um, let's say that you as a human are the ground truth classifier. You can obviously distinguish between humans and sprites, and you are not getting confused by this red necklace. So that means that patch function of the red necklace was consistent with respect to you. Um, we can also loosen this a little bit and say that a patch function is one minus beta consistent if you are consistent on all but a beta fraction of the data distribution. Uh, so it's the same thing. And this is just notation. Um, what I do want to point out, uh, so it's not super important because a lot of these arguments are going to be obvious in context. But what I do want to point out is that you can be one consistent and not be fully consistent because there can, you can be consistent on all but, let's say, a measure zero subset of the data distribution. So this will come up a little bit later, but uh, more concretely. So, yeah. And just as a convention, let's assume that the set of patch functions always contains the identity function. We can quickly check that the identity function is a fully consistent patch function because patch of x equals x, and this means h star of x equals h star of x. Like the identity function just changes nothing. Okay, so now let's set up how the adverse, like the order of events, uh, so we can see exactly when in the pipeline the adversary is poisoning things, and then we can see what the learner, what information the learner gets, what information the adversary gets, and so on. So let's first generate an instance of a learning problem. So we'll pick a data domain script x, a data distribution script D, a hypothesis class script H, so like the set of functions that the learner can pick from, a true labeler H star, uh, a target label. So the target label is what the uh, adversary wants you to confuse the data to become. So in that building example, the target label was yes, and uh, a patch function class F adverb picked. So let's tell the learner what the data domain is, what the functions they're allowed to choose from are, and what the set of valid perturbations are. And we'll give the adversary everything. So it's a pretty powerful adversary. You're telling it the data distribution, the, um, the, the, the domain, the hypothesis class, the set of valid perturbations, and the target label. The adversary is going to now pick a patch function from uh, the set of valid perturbations and make sure that's consistent with the ground truth labeler, or like at least almost everywhere consistent. So it's consistent everywhere except for a set of measure zero. And the adversary is now going to construct a backdoor set of the following form. 
um, we're going to construct a backdoor set S adv where each member of the backdoor set is of the form X comma T. So X is an example, T is a target label. So the adversary is going to mislabel examples and, it's going to, and the adversary is going to sample these examples from the distribution um, script D conditioned on H star of X not equal to T. So we're going to take examples whose true label is the opposite of T. Um, sample from that, apply the patch function, mislabel them, and then stick them into the, the set S add. And then the uh, learner is going to select parameters epsilon, clean, and delta. And then it observes a trading set that is the union of a clean set and an adversarial set. The learner is not going to know which example comes from which set. And the, um, the learner's parameters are going to be roughly the parameters that um, will, okay, the exact, the exact notation here is not super important, but basically what the learner wants to do is to pick a training set such that the following is guaranteed. The, uh, with probability one minus delta over draws of the clean set, you get a classifier that has at most epsilon error over the data distribution. So are there any questions about the order of things here? I don't see any questions, so I suppose it's reasonable. Okay, okay good, good. So what does the adversary want to achieve? So uh, remember from the building example that informally, the adversary wanted to do the following. So given a target label, so let's say we want to confuse, or the adversary wants the learner to confuse the red necklace sprites with being real people, so the target label was yes. The adversary wants to pick a patch function from the set of consistent patch functions like that are consistent with the ground truth. So here it was the red necklace, such that patch data, whose true label is opposite of the target label, so sprites, are classified as being safe or being allowed into this building by the learner's classifier. Uh, so formally, we want to draw uh, the learner, okay, we, the, the adversary wants to draw a backdoor set S F sample from this distribution, such that the following is true. For every example that the, um, the adversary is drawing, the true label is opposite that of the target label, so that's what the second condition says but the adversary is mislabeling it intentionally. So that's what the first, like y is equal to t is saying. Um, next, there exists an h hat in script h that can perfectly fit the training set. So um, you want the learner to be able to fit both the clean examples and the adversarial examples. So which means that the learner should not be able to observe that something has gone wrong by just observing the training error. And then you want the following to be true. So really the important thing is the last line. So for um, patched examples, uh, you want, okay, so the learner is going to output this function h hat, and the, you want the pat, you want the learner to be correct. So this is saying that the learner is correct. You want this to happen with pretty low probability. So the adversary can pick this probability and use this to, pick the size of the set as add, and then you want, the, the adversary wants the learner to have this property. The chance that you agree, so the chance that the learner's function agrees with the ground truth is small, which means that the learner pretty reliably makes a mistake on patched examples. So this is like the formal condition, but just observe that this is pretty intuitive with the building example. Or if, if, if you find it confusing, just refer back to the building example, I guess. So let's look at a class of functions where the adversary can win and where such a thing is possible. So let's say that script H is a class of decision lists over three bits. And let's say that D is a data distribution uh, where you were looking at the uniform distribution over vectors whose last bit is zero. And pick you know, any H star of X. And let's say that the patch, the set of valid patch functions is going to be the set of functions that contains both the identity function and the function that just sets the last bit to one. So the adversary can pick any target label T, draw from this um, distribution of um, you know, 
the distribution of examples whose true label is not the target label, and then create any corrupted set of patched examples labeled as a target label. And if we pick any target label and look at the following function, h hat of x, then we can observe that this function will agree with both um, h, ha, h star of x on everything on the data distribution, but also behaves however the adversary wants on off distribution examples or on patched examples. So the key thing to observe here is that, um, so let's look at the case where the data is coming from the data distribution, which means the last bit is zero. This means that the first line of this decision list doesn't execute, and uh, we go to the last line. And if it's the last line, then we're just outputting h star of x. So this is obviously consistent with h star of x. On the other hand, let's say that we look at a, look at a patched example, and the patch is going to be, again, the function that's setting the last bit to one. So this means if x3 is equal to one, that line is going to execute, then we're outputting the target label. And we can unroll this into a longer decision list. So this is itself a decision list, which means that there was a function in the learner's class that was able to fit any training data, still agree with h star of x on the distribution examples, but also behave the way the adversary wants it to on the backdoor examples. So intuitively, this doesn't this this function or this whole corruption process does not impact the behavior of the learned classifier on uncorrupted data. And so the learner is now finding an h hat of x such that the probability with respect to the data distribution that h hat of x is equal to h star of x is equal to one. So this means that on test data, the learner wouldn't notice that something was horribly wrong because on clean test data, the function is actually doing what the learner wants it to do. Um, but it's just behaving also specifically on uh, a, a backdoor set. Right. OK. So before I move on to describing memori how memorization and like excess capacity contributes to this, are there any questions about the formalization of the backdoor setting? I don't think there are any questions. OK, cool. Yeah, let's OK. okay let's move on to uh, the main quantity of interest that we study here, which will cause memorization capacity. And the idea is that this will capture. Um, the, this will this will sort of capture the vulnerability of a learning problem to a backdoor attack. OK, so r recall that the adversary wants the learner to simultaneously do the following things. Generalize on script on, on clean examples from the data distribution. But and at the same time, memorize a function of the adversary's choice on seemingly irrelevant data. So uh, given this, we can ask the question, can we quantify the excess capacity present in an instance of a learning problem that lends itself to such a memorization? And if we can do this, then can we characterize exactly how the excess capacity makes an instance of a learning problem vulnerable to backdoor data poisoning attacks? Uh, sorry, did you define excess capacity before or? Um, not yet, but uh, this is like a loose notion. Uh, we'll formalize it in a bit. Yeah. So uh, just let, let's, let's, let's visually motivate what's going on here. We want to capture the notion of memorizing K irrelevant sets. And what I mean by memorizing is we want to be able to take K irrelevant sets and label them however we want. Um, and if we can do this, that means the adversary could just give the learner these irrelevant sets, have the learner memorize those labels, and then the learner is now going to behave on those irrelevant sets however the adversary wants it to. So let's look at, um, okay, let's, let's visually look at this. So let's say that we have k sets x1 through xk, and then we have the rest of the distribution script d. So here the measure of all of the sets x1 through xk is going to be zero, which means, you know, which is formalizing this notion of irrelevance. And we're going to label them however we want. So let's say that the adversary wants x1 to be labeled as plus one, x2 to be labeled as plus two, plus one, x3 is minus one, and so on. So you can assign like b1 through bk, uh, you know, as plus one or minus one, depending on what the adversary wants x1 through xk to be labeled as. But on the rest of the distribution here on script D, you want, or the learner and the adversary both want to be able to fit H star or something close to H star on script D. 
So we want to capture the notion of being able to label all these sets, x1 through xk, however we want, but still being able to fit the function h star on, on uh, script D. So given this motivation, let's set up um, a formal definition for memorization capacity or excess capacity. So suppose we're in the setting where we're learning a hypothesis class script H over a domain script X under distribution script D. So like some learning problem. Uh, think about the previous slide. Now we want to say we can memorize K irrelevant subsets from some uh, family of subsets of the domain on top of a fixed function H if we can find k non-empty but measure zero subsets, x1 through xk from this family, that satisfies the measure is zero, such that for every way you label the sets, so that's what this is saying, so for every way we label these sets, there exists a classifier in the set of functions that we can pick from, such that the following are true. For all um, points in the set, we are labeling the point um, however we want, but also on the distribution, we're agreeing with the ground truth function. So go back to this example. Um, let's say that x1 through xk are from this valid family of subsets of the domain that we can memorize. We're saying that we can memorize x1 through xk if we can label them however we want, and also able to achieve the true function on the rest of the data distribution. Now we're just going to sort of remove arguments from this. So let's define memorization capacity with these parameters to be the maximum number of sets from script C we can memorize for a fixed function H. And then let's say that we look at all measurable subsets of the domain. Um, then we're going to drop the argument script C. And then well, the worst case of this quantity over all functions in the function class is going to be written as this. So if the notation is a little confusing, just um, you know, remembering this is like the main thing I want you to remember. Like remembering this picture. So let's look at the decision list example again in this language. So let's say that script H is the class of decision lists over, you know, the, the three hypercube. And let's look at the same distribution as last time. If I pick any H star in script H, the subset, uh, of all vectors such that the last bit is one is a memorizable subset. And now we're going to fix a target label T and look at the following function H hat of X. So remember that this is the same decision list that we had last time. If X3 is one, then I'll put whatever the adversary wants you to output. Otherwise output H star of X. So we have this condition here that we wanted the, that the function that the learner outputs is agreeing with the true function on all distribution inputs. Um, but also we're able to fit any set whose um, last bit is one and, that, and that's labeled however we want. So if you're familiar with VC dimension, you might observe that memorization capacity is morally pretty similar to VC dimension. So DC dimension is pretty similar to memorization where C is the family of singletons and if we don't have to agree with H star. So uh, we can quickly show that the following inequality holds. So this is, cap this is explicitly capturing how close uh, memorization capacity is to VC dimension. And in fact, it, it could be pretty far away from VC dimension, like both of these inequalities are, are tight. And I won't go, the proof is pretty quick, so I won't go through it. Um, okay, so now that we set this up, let's go and look at some of our main results that we get in this paper. So loosely, the advers remember that the adversary's goals are can be phrased as the following. The adversary wants a learner to generalize to script D, and the learner also or the adversary also wants a learner to memorize a function of the adversary's choice on irrelevant data. So uh, in the previous slides, we did answer the following question positively. Can we quantify the excess capacity present in an instance of a learning problem that sort of corresponds to memorization? And if we can do this, can we characterize how this excess capacity, this quantification of it, makes an instance of a learning problem vulnerable to backdoor attacks? So now that we've quantified what excess capacity means and we've sort of formally defined it, we're going to try to use this to capture how 
vulnerable or learning problem is to backdoor attacks. So our first result uh, can be informally stated as follows. If the learner can memorize the images of K patch functions from the family of patch functions, then the adversary can execute actually K successful backdoor attacks at the same time. So um, remember that our memorization capacity was defined with respect to a family of subsets of the data domain. So this family of subsets can be, we will not think of it as the images of K different patch functions or the images of all possible patch functions from the class of patch functions that we're allowing to pick from. So the formal statement, which is, this is from the paper, uh, the, the formal statement as follows. So um, basically, like, we'll pick some target label in plus or minus one. Uh, we'll set up a learning problem. So that's the second sentence. And let's look at the images of patch functions uh, that we're allowed to pick from. And let's say that we're able to memorize at least one of those patch functions. Then that means there is a patch function that we can pick. And then the adversary can draw a set of roughly this size. So this is corresponding to like the VC dimension of the, of the, of the function class, um, such that with, with high probability over the draws of the, over like random sampling of the adversarial set, the adversary achieves its goals and the important thing to realize here is that this is independent of the number of samplers, samples that the learner draws from uh, the clean distribution. So no matter how many clean samples the learner has, as long as the adversary draws enough bad examples, the adversary's attack still succeeds. So you could still have a vanishingly small fraction of, um, of bad examples in the training set. And this is enough to um, implant the backdoor, so to speak. So um, I, the proof is pretty simple, so I won't, I mean, I'll, I'll just outline it. So from the memorization capacity, this means that we can find a function h hat that fits both the, um, that fits both the adversarial set and the clean set at the same time. And then you just apply uniform convergence and a union bound, and we generalize to both distributions at the same time. So is there, are there any questions about that part of the result? So that's sort of the main negative result. Um, like saying that the, this, this quantity is capturing how many backdoor attacks can be done at the same time. So are there any questions about this? So the, these statements that you make as your hypothesis, like uh, the, the learner can uh, can successfully learn K patches and stuff. How do you translate back that back to practice? Uh, good, good question. So this means that maybe the learner has K different noise things or K different triggers. So let's say like there's not only a red necklace and maybe there's like a red, green, blue, whatever or maybe like the sprites wearing pants or something. Uh, these can all serve as different backdoor triggers. So maybe in a binary classification problem, it's not super interesting, but in a multi-way classification problem, let's say like CFAR 10, where you have 10 classes, um, you could have maybe a different backdoor, like one for each class. Um, so, maybe if, so maybe if the learner thought they were looking for one specific uh, piece of noise, um, that might not actually capture the full um, extent of what's going on because there might be different um, variations of that noise that are being applied to confuse the learner or something like this. So this means that the learner can actually, or the adversary can actually draw a, a variety of different uh, patch functions and sort of, there's sort of K different ways for the, um, for the adversary to confuse the learner. But if, if you have a general purpose uh, learning algorithm, statistical learning mm -hmm. or sort of um, uh, neural network or whatever, how do you quantify those type of uh, patches in, in those general settings? Yeah, so uh, by quantify, do you mean um, like how do you express the set F ad? Like how do you express the set of possible patch uh, no, functions? Uh, well, I mean, your, your theorems, do need some sort of quantification, right? So, so the, the statement was if the learner has the capacity of learning, say, K patches, and how do I know whether mm -hmm. a general learner has this capacity or not? 
Okay, so uh, I think it's known that it, it sh- okay. I think it's known that it's hard to test this. Like it's hard in a complexity theoretic sense. Like I think, um, so it's something that maybe you can, or, or I think it is uh, that I'm, okay. Yeah. You might have to know details about the learning problem and then you might be able to like prove something about the learning problem by hand and then say that, um, you, and then maybe draw this conclusion. But I think in general for some like BC class, it might, I, I, I think it, maybe I'm misquoting a result, but I was under the impression that it was hard to even calculate the VC dimension, which means that um, you can probably reduce from that to saying it's hard to estimate the memorization capacity. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, it, it does. I, I'm, I'm trying to think what the implication of that for practical application of your results would be. So you're basically saying it's difficult to find out how many backdoors are there for, for any type of uh, general learning. It, I think it might be hard in like a computational complexity sense, but that, um, but like a variety of things are hard in a computational complexity sense that people can still accomplish in practice, like learning a neural network. So. Um, it's possible that there are some like heuristics that work that help you get a sense of whether something is possible. Another thing that you could do to guess whether a learning problem is vulnerable is to try to attack it yourself before you like learn on real world data and deploy in real world data. And empirically, how easily you succeed could um, be some kind of indication of whether mm-hmm. the problem is vulnerable to an attack. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll also go through some like other learning problems that are somewhat closer to practice that um, for which it is pretty easy to determine the memorization capacity. Um, so the, the on the flip side, we can say that um, if the memorization capacity is zero, then if the learner draws enough clean data, then the learner will be able to find out that something is wrong by just minimizing classific- misclassification error and then uh, detect that there's a backdoor attack. So per our definition, uh, suppose that we have a hypothesis, like you know, a learning problem. And if the memorization capacity is zero, then no backdoor data poisoning can attack. A attack can succeed regardless of the choice of patch function that we draw from, F, um, from, from the class of patch functions. So the proof outline here is, um, you know, suppose that there exists a valid backdoor data poisoning attack, then we can show that there must have been an irrelevant memorizable set X, which implies that there would have existed a function H star, such that the memorization capacity with respect to that function was at least one. But I claim that it was zero, so this is a contradiction. Um, Like there's a few extra details, but like roughly this is how it goes. So let's go through some examples, like some more concrete examples that may or may not be closer to practice that um, for which we can either prove something about robustness or lack thereof. So what our results really show is that we have like a formulaic way of showing whether a problem is vulnerable, at least under our framework, to a backward data poisoning attack. So um, let's, okay. So to show that an attack exists, we can find a target classifier H star, a domain and data distribution, uh, and a class of hash functions F at. And then we show that under that setup, the memorization capacity is at least one for that given function. And on the flip side, to show that a problem is robust, we should just show that the memorization capacity is zero. So let's look at an example where, first let's look at an example where we can capture attack, like the presence of the existence of an attack. So let's say we're in a setting where we're learning a linear separator. So just like a linear classifier. And our data lies in some low dimensional subspace that is unknown to the learner. This is satisfied in a variety of data sets, like I think the Yale phase data set, for instance, satisfies this. Um, Then the adversary can find a small additive vector eta whose presence induces a misclassification. So what do I mean by this? So let's say that W star is the optimal weight vector or the weight vector that is being used to um, classify ground truth examples. 
And let's say that W hat is um, the weight vector that the learner recovers. And let's say that um, you know, X looks like this, right? So the first S features, let's say, are relevant. And then the last D minus S features are irrelevant. So notice that if we take the inner product between W star and X here, um, we're just getting the inner product between like this truncated version of W star and X, where we're dropping off the last D minus S things. Um, but we can also fit a function W hat such that if these last D minus S features are set up in such a way, or in a specific way, then we can write, um, we can find weights W hat S plus one up to W hat D, such that when we take that inner product as well, that will overwhelm the signal in the first, that, it, that is resulting from that um, inner product between the first S truncation. So, uh, so clearly this is, um, appears to only hold in the case where um, this relevant subspace is like that spanned by the first S basis vectors or even spanned by S standard basis vectors in general. But this is actually um, more general than that. Like this is just a visualization of what's going on. But really all that you need is that the data lies in some S dimensional subspace that is unknown to the learner. And because inner products are sort of invariant of the basis, um, the same thing uh, will happen where you can find weights in uh, W hat such that those weights will amplify the irrelevant features and sort of overwhelm the signal in the correct subspace. So specifically what we mean is the following. So let's say that the data domain is RD, but let's say that the support of the data distribution is um, some subset, uh, some S dimensional subset um, subspace, sorry, of um, RD. So that's what this is saying. So we're living in the span of this matrix in RD by S. So um, it's an S-dimensional subspace. Um, suppose uh, the data distribution and H star uh, are set up such that it, there is like a large margin classifier on the original distribution. And let's say that the class of patch functions is all of those um, such that you're not perturbing the input point by more than the margin. So these are this is like the class of, let's say, all small perturbations that are not confusing H star. Because if you move the, as long as you don't move the point by more than the margin, you're never going to confuse the true classifier. Um, however, this is enough to get that the memorization capacity here is at least one. And in fact, we can show that it's at least D minus S, where S is the dimension of the subspace and D is the dimension of the ambient space. And the proof is the following. So let's, say, let's set a patch of X to be X plus eta, where eta is sort of orthogonal to the span of the subspace, or is orthogonal to the subspace. And the patch function, like the patch vector is smaller than the margin. And let's say that W star is the weight vector that corresponds to H hat such that um, the norm of W star is corresponding to the margin. And we can just uh, check algebraically that the following classifier here memorizes the image of patch of X when the true label of X is um, not that of the target. So um, this, is, uh, this is like the corrupted weight vector. This is the input point. And what's gonna happen is this extra corruption here is not going to be active when X lies in the correct subspace. But as soon as X is off the correct subspace and it has this um, extra eta additive term in it, then this term here is going to amplify the signal. Uh, it's going to sort of amplify that um, bad signal. So this is sort of an, this is an example of a practical case where you can pretty quickly check what the memorization capacity is if you knew what the dimension of the, um, the true data were. Um, but if you don't know what the dimension of the true data is, then it's kind of hopeless. Or I, I think it is, yeah. So are there any questions about that example? Okay. Sorry? No, no, I just oh, want to no? say I don't see any questions. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, yeah, we'll move on. So on the other hand, let's look at a case where we can show that um, the learning problem is robust to a backdoor data poisoning attack. So let's again look at linear separators, but we're going to look at the, uh, the where the data distribution is uniform over 
or some convex body. So let's say that you're classifying things that are uniformly distributed in the unit ball. Um, then this result will apply. So let's just say that um, H is a set of origin containing half spaces. And let's just say that you're not allowed to pick any. The data distribution is going to include every point except for those that lie on the surface of the true classifier. So you never have something where um, the point lies exactly on the, on the surface of the classifier. And let's say that the distribution is uniform over this convex body. Then we can show that the memorization capacity with respect to that specific function is zero. And the way to see this is um, the following. So if the adversary succeeds, it must do so regardless of the number of samples a learner draws from script D. So what we can do is say that, or intuitively what happens is as a learner draws uh, an infinite number of samples from script D, the learner is going to cover the convex hulls of the decision regions. And for a linear classifier, the convex hull of a decision region is exactly the decision region itself. So this is actually going to heavily rely on the convexity of the decision region. So, so like the idea is that the half space separates, so if you take the intersection of a half space and a convex body, you get two other convex bodies. And the fact that these are convex is very important. So the lemma that we end up showing that is useful is the following. So let's say that k prime is the measure one subset um, of a convex body k, where k is endowed with a uniform distribution. Then um, the convex hull of k prime will cover every interior point of the convex body k. And then what we are going to do from this is to assume that there is an irrelevant memorizable set X. So this is the assumption we'll make for the sake of contradiction. And then we'll say that um, we'll find a measure one subset of script X, and then say that the convex hull of that is going to cover every interior point of script X as per our lemma. And then we'll show that the irrelevant memorizable set must have also contained at least one interior point from script X. But this would then yield a contradiction. So there are several other examples where um, we can, okay, so definitely here, um, the convexity of the decision regions is important because we can show other examples for which the data distribution, let's say covers the whole domain or every element in the domain is in the support of the data distribution, but there is still um, like vulnerability to backdoor poisoning attack because of like non-convexity issues. Um, but the examples are in the paper. So now I'm going to move on to more algorithmic ideas that may be more applicable in practice um, that may help mitigate against backward data poisoning attacks. So the first idea that we have algorithmically is, um, in a sense, failing loudly. So all the algorithms that we assumed that the learner had in the previous parts are just those that are minimizing misclassification error. But perhaps the learner is able to do something more sophisticated, like adversarial training or data augmentation or something like this, then can the learner do something more interesting? And the answer is yes, sometimes. So um, I'm, just, I'm running a little low on time, so I'm going to go a little bit more quickly. But let's just say that the learner can minimize what I call as um, robust loss. So what I mean by this is take a point, look at some small neighborhood around that point, if everything around there is classified consistently, then we'll say that the loss is zero. Otherwise, we'll say that the loss is one. So in this adversarial training setup, what people do is um, they're, they take some training point. They, let's say, perform a gradient minimization step on that, or like a gradient descent step on that point. And then they also look at a bunch of points in a neighborhood around that uh, initial point. And if, thing, and if at least one point in that neighborhood were misclassified, so if at least one point there could have been a test time adversarial example, then we'll say that the loss for that one initial point was one. And we add that adversarial example into the training set and then do another gradient descent step on that point. So um, under some conditions, uh, the learner can actually do this kind of minimization, like this kind of um, adversarial training to measure the quality of the training set. So let's say the learner is expecting to recover a robust classifier on the training set. So if they were to measure like robust loss using this data augmentation scheme, then they're expecting a pretty low robust loss, let's say. Um, however, if the learner actually gets a high robust loss on their training set, 
then the learner can use this to sort of throw up a red flag and say, hey, there's something wrong with my training set. So we actually implemented such a workflow on the MNIST uh, data set. And um, the results are and experiments and the setup is in the paper. So feel free to take a look at it and ask if you have any questions. So I'm going to skip the proof of this. And the last algorithmic thing that we look at is um, for what learning problems can we say that there is an algorithm that um, accomplishes the goals of the learner, which is to sort of defeat the attack. Um, another similar question that we can ask is if we're given a training set that is the union of some clean and some bad examples and you don't know which is which, can you delete most of the bad examples and not delete that many of the clean examples? So can you do, can you do like a, you know, sort of a precise and accurate um, deletion or like filtering algorithm? Um, and the original problem that we had was if we're given a training set that is the union of clean and bad examples, can we obtain a classifier that is robust to test time adversarial perturbations or that is robust to backdoors? So uh, these two problems, I'll call them as backdoor filtering, so deleting stuff in the training set, and robust generalization. Given a training set and you can do some fancy algorithm, can you get a good classifier? And what we actually show is that under some conditions, these two problems are actually equivalent. So I mean, what I mean by equivalent is if you can solve backdoor filtering, then you can solve robust generalization. And if you can solve robust generalization, you can solve backdoor filtering. The motivation for this is that if a lot of algorithms that we've seen in practice approach the robust generalization problem by first trying to identify and delete bad examples from the training set. And the question is, is this always necessary, like algorithmically? And our result says that at least indirectly, this is the case. So um, the, the informal statement is if we can solve the backdoor filtering problem up to outlier tolerance alpha, so which means that alpha fraction of the examples in the training set were outliers, then we can solve the robust generalization problem also up to an outlier tolerance of alpha. And in the other direction is if we can solve the robust generalization problem up to outlier tolerance to alpha, then we can solve the backdoor filtering problem up to outlier tolerance alpha. And the upshot here is that these problems are like statistically roughly equivalent. And the reductions are going to assume basically that you can do adversarial training efficiently, um, which in practice, like, you know, it, it varies as to whether you can do this, but yeah. So just to wrap up everything we talked about, um, we have defined a formal framework within which one can discuss backdoor data poisoning attacks. We have identified memorization capacity as a parameter of interest that characterizes under our framework vulnerability to backdoor data poisoning attacks. And then we use memorization capacity to argue about the robustness or lack thereof of a few learning problems to backdoor data poisoning attacks. Uh, there are more examples in the paper than what we uh, talked about in the slides, so feel free to check that if you're interested. And um, we gave a high-level algorithm for de detecting training set contamination under several assumptions. And then under similar assumptions to that, we showed that backdoor filtering and robust generalization are like equivalent in a certain sense. So some questions that are probably interesting research directions that our work suggests are the following. So one robust learning strategy could be to try to minimize the memorization capacity that's present in a learning problem. Um, so maybe you don't know what the memorization capacity is, but if you had some way to, you know, minimize it or even completely eliminate it, does that suffice as a robust learning strategy? And if so, like, what are the qualifiers? Um, a lot of our results are also sort of implicitly assuming an infinite data setting. So can we make more finite data setting um, statements? And how powerful is an adversary against a learner that's using a more sophisticated family of learners? So maybe you have like a regularizer or something else. We briefly teased at this by saying that if the learner is using um, robust ERM or like robust training, instead of just minimizing misclassification error, then maybe something better is possible. But we don't know like what other things could be done. And for what problems do there exist backdoor robust learning algorithms, both like problems of theoretical interest and those of practical interest. 
Um, the latest version of our paper is up at this archive link. So um, feel free to take a look and message me if you have any questions. And uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you very much, uh, Naren. Let's see whether there are any questions. We already had quite a few uh, questions during the talk. Are there any further questions? So is there a clear link between, so, so you said you could empirically kind of estimate this capacity uh, of, of, of a learning uh, framework. Uh, is there any direct link between adversarial attacks and the capacity? So, so how could we potentially estimate that, that, that capacity? That's a good question. So, um, yeah, these these two things are very closely linked. In fact, I think you can morally think of backdoor attacks as training time adversarial attacks. Um, in that sort of small perturbations being valid at training time are also likely those that were valid at test time as test time adversarial examples. Um, also sort of um, but yeah, I think like anything beyond that remains open. Like in particular, it would be interesting to see whether memorization capacity uh, allows one to argue anything about vulnerability the test time adversarial examples. Like the test time adversarial example problem isn't pretty well studied, but I wonder, or like we wonder if there's a link between sort of quantities that we've set up and this thing. So yeah. But intuitively they're linked, right? Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's intuitively, like I believe that there's some connection like morally they seem very similar but making a formal statement uh, we yeah it's an it would be interesting to do that okay um thank you very much let's see whether there are any further questions any further questions from the audience i don't see any further questions so effie and uh, jose are, are thanking you for the talk so thank you very much again a uh, very interesting um theory for um uh, for backdoor poisoning. Actually, in two mm. weeks time, we will have another edition of the verifiability talk, and that will be about the uh, practice of similar problems. So there are adversarial mm. attacks being used to test uh, machine learning algorithms. And the talk will be given by Hector Menendez, um, our new lecturer at King's, who will be joining also the node. Um, uh, well, he has already joined the node, but we will be working on testing uh, machine learning algorithms. Thanks again, uh, okay. Naren, and uh, Thank you all for being here. Have a nice uh, remainder of the day and see you in two weeks time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.